The subject of this video is going to be my attempt to answer a question, and the question is why do I climb mountains? It's a question I've asked myself before and been asked, but never really examined in too much depth or tried all that hard to answer. I guess I've always just tacitly supposed that the force that beckons and compels me is strong enough to serve as its own justification. I've never really seen it as standing in need of a why or a because. It would be kind of like asking why something is beautiful. But nevertheless, after pondering it for a while, I do think there are some interesting insights to be had from addressing the question, and plus someone just posed it to me again recently, so I figured I'd make this video on it. I hope I can at least point in the direction of an answer. I'm not going to address how anyone else might have answered the question before. This is just going to be my reflection and interpretation of my own experiences. But that being said, I imagine there is probably significant overlap between different perspectives on the matter. So yeah, why would I do that? Why would I get up at 4, 3, or 2 in the morning, drive for 2 or 3 hours, endure hours of laborious inclines through often uncomfortable and dangerous conditions to reach the top of a gigantic rock formation, only to turn around and go all the way back down again on often aching knees and rubbery legs, and go all the way back home and be sore and tired as hell for the next two days. Why would I put myself through that? Well, of course, that's a one-sided description deliberately crafted to beg the question of, of what could be compelling enough to outweigh these considerations, and not only outweigh them, but outweigh them with an enthusiasm left over at the end of the equation. What, what compelling thing would that be? I don't, I don't have a short, catchy answer or a one-word aha type of answer. I don't think it's that simple. It might be helpful as a preliminary to ask what my reasons are for engaging in any activity like this, and it could be instructive to consider that what we're probably talking about is a number of activities going on at the same time and being grouped together and collectively placed under the heading of a single activity, in this case mountain climbing. And this probably has largely to do with the inherent nature and shortcomings of language itself. After all, I can carry many things around in one basket, and words are no different. So correspondingly, at the level of the mind and the psyche, I imagine what this means is that there are probably multiple reasons for engaging in an activity like this, multiple, multiple motives present simultaneously. I'm going to imagine just for a moment that I'm walking up a trail on a high mountainside and a, and a bird flutters across my field of vision. I see the visual image of the bird, I hear it make its call, and maybe I even feel an onrush of air from the flapping of its wings. Now these disparate st stimuli are brought together in the mind's eye to produce a very tight, very cohesive, very unified and original picture of what's happened of the bird flying by. I think it's here, within the realm of reflecting on these basic everyday types of sense experiences, that we encounter ourselves as these singular, unified, unadulterated, and unadulteratable beings. This also seems to be where words like I and me find their greatest meaning and import. But such isn't really the case with motives. Motives seem to be a much more loosely bundled inventory. And it's when we examine things like our motives that we encounter the contrasting image of ourselves, not as these singular, unified beings, but as something much more composite, much more of a patchwork, a cornucopia. It's here that we might talk about, I don't know, the, the potpourri of the spirit or something. The first high mountain climbs I ever went on, my dad brought me on years ago. And as I would recollect, the reasons for our going on those occasions were, well, besides the important distinction of numbering more than just one, I would recollect that what animated us on those early occasions, broadly speaking, was the challenge of it, the aesthetic experience of nature, and the aim to spend some quality time together. So that's how it originated for me, and certainly very much of importance can be found in the origins of a thing. But that being said, a thing can nevertheless become detached, untethered, or at least loosened from its origins and turn into something else. The items in its basket, as it were, can become different, like the way the books on my shelf might be different than the ones that used to occupy it. 
Most of the mountain climbs I do now I go on by myself, but occasionally someone goes with me, so sometimes the social aspect of it still enters in as a motivating factor. But for the most part, nowadays I definitely go I still definitely go for the challenge and for the aesthetic experience. Another motive that could be said to exist would be the exercise. Now this is something I've found, especially in recent years, to be vital to mental as well as physical health, and the two of course are not unrelated. So that's always a drive I bring with me on a mountain, the drive to improve and maintain physical health. But certainly, mountain climbing isn't the only way to get some good exercise. There are many other ways I can do that, but when I climb a mountain, I do bring that with me as part of my bundle of motives. For this reason, I will, I will refer to exercise as, as an instance of what I would call an attending or an attendant motive. That is to say, a motive that is satisfied by mountain climbing, but which could easily be satisfied by other means. Now, are, are there other attendant motives? Yeah, I think so. I imagine the aspect of the challenge of it could be reckoned in this category also. When I think of all the other ways I could meet my desire for a challenge, I could run marathons, I could play a sport, I could play board games. But again, the challenge is definitely an aspect that attends my climb up a mountain. And I suppose the same could largely be said of the social aspect, too. There are plenty of other things I could do with someone else. We could go have a drink, we could go to a show, we could play the board game, or any, of, any number of other things. So what about the aesthetic motive, then? What about the experience of nature and the beauties and the ambience therein? Again, there are other ways to accomplish that, too. I could take a stroll along a river, or watch a beautiful sunrise, say. Another thing worth talking about here is fear. Normally I might be inclined to talk about fear as being a motive against something like mountain climbing, whether it's fear of the wilderness, fear of long arduous hikes in general, fear of getting lost, but especially the fear of heights. This can and has been a sort of anti-motive for me to climb certain mountains and certain routes, but what happens when we decide to consciously and deliberately face our fear? I suppose then we could talk about fear becoming an actual positive motivator, and about the object of fear itself, generally speaking, as magnetic in both the repulsive and attractive senses of the comparison. But again, though, there are other situations I might avoid due to fear, and also other situations I might purposely place myself in to face my fear. I could go stand on a high-rise balcony, or go skydiving, or climb up a high ladder. So far I've discussed a number of different motives for mountain climbing, but if all of them are only attendant and could be pursued elsewhere, then what is it for me that's unique to this particular activity? Is there anything? One possible answer could be habituation. Maybe I've grown so accustomed to having this be my outlet for this confluence of drives that it's the sheer force of habit itself that brings me back to it again and again in what's become an almost ritualized way. And really, when you think of it, habituation, in as much as it could be considered motivational, couldn't be an attending motive, because just conceptually, by definition, it would only adhere to the activity in question. So is that it then? Can I say that's why I like to go on mountain climbs? Because it satisfies this assortment of attending motives and happens to be my activity of choice for doing so? having arisen out of the contingent happenstance of going on those first few climbs years ago that I referred to? Maybe that's it. Maybe that's enough to explain the why of it. I think it's at least a good start or a good foundation, but there's something that speaks to me and tells me that's not quite the whole story. I can't seem to entirely escape, escape the sense that there's something about doing the mountain climbs that I can't get or at least don't get from doing anything else. So let's reconsider the aesthetic for a moment. There are different types of experience to be had when it comes to the aesthetic of nature. Suppose I go on a stroll on a path in a valley alongside a babbling creek, amid a lush forest with flowers and grasses and chirping birds and the sun shining down. A scene like that would surely be considered beautiful, besides that maybe serene or even cozy or inviting. But when I think of going up rugged rocks on a high, airy, rarefied, and desolate mountain slope, the adjectives become different. For me, cozy and inviting don't necessarily come to mind here. 
It's definitely still beautiful, but what kind of beauty are we talking about? Again, when I think of being in that high alpine environment or even of looking up at it from below, or taking in that panoramic vista from the top and all of its breadth and its distance and its depth, when I think of these things, I think of encountering the vast, the spatially vast, the temporally vast, and the vast in terms of the imposing and the majestic. And related to this, I also think of encountering a very real and very proximate forbidding quality. In short, I think what's afforded me aesthetically by mountain climbing is the encounter with the sublime. So I think it's, that's probably the closest I can come to identifying a motivating factor unique to mountain climbing. Now to be sure, climbing mountains isn't the only sublime experience to be had. I could get that by peering out at the expanse of the open ocean, say, or maybe by looking up at the night sky. But if I wanted to go back to the talk about the origins of a thing and becoming habituated to it, I might say that for me, having lived in the vicinity of these peaks my whole life, as far as sublime experiences go, climbing them has always been the activity that's been most immediately, most readily, and most conspicuously available to me. So on a practical level, I could say that within the limited context of my existence, the profoundly sublime has been something that for me has been effectively unique to climbing mountains. Another thing I ought to mention is personality. I suppose it's reasonable to figure that most people who regularly go on high mountain climbs are animated by some or all of the attending motives mentioned, and I suppose a lot of them also are seeking out that sublime aesthetic. I guess these inclinations could come from both innate character traits as well as arise out of life's circumstances. For example, someone who naturally has an athletic body type could be more drawn to the physical and to physical challenges. As another example, I might consider that for me, given the trajectory of life and the circumstances that have existed and the things that have happened, from early on and for better or for worse, I became a more inwardly reflective and individualistic type of person, which, as some of you probably know, definitely comes with its own dangers and pitfalls, to speak again of the sublime. But yeah, I think I was rendered more inward and individualist and... And again, as many of you I'm sure can relate to, and also as someone who's often impelled to get away from the discordant, alienating cacophony of society and its trappings and its infrastructures. So, I suppose what I would suggest is that maybe what I get from my encounter with the sublime is the outward projection of the inward, of the inner. So perhaps it could be understood as a kind of self-encounter, only in a reversed sort of way, as of seeing oneself from the inside out rather than vice versa. Now understood this way, I might see it as no surprise that when I'm on a mountain climb, my prevailing state of mind seems to be characterized by a lack of thought. Or maybe not a lack of thought entirely, but a lack of what we might consider higher thought, a lack of an internal monologue or dialogue, a, a, lack of, a lack of what is toilsome, burdensome, tedious, and distressing in thought, a lack of all but what's minimally necessary for me to perceive my natural surroundings and my movement within them. And I should also mention the crucial facilitative role that I think exercise plays here. The, ry the, the rhythms of bodily exertion seem to resonate with, with the aesthetic and to help drown out any tendency toward toward the mentally taxing. All in all, for these reasons, the experience is very therapeutic, very refreshing, very rejuvenating, you could maybe say meditative, at any rate, generally quite spiritual. So why then do I climb mountains? Given the multiplicity of motives, the answer, as I suggested, is likely different now than at some point in the past. And even now, the answer likely depends on the particular occasion. Maybe on some days I'm especially focused on the exercise aspect of it. Maybe I'm doing an easier route on a mountain to get ready for one with higher endurance stats. Or maybe on some other occasion I have someone accompanying me, so the motive to enjoy our time becomes more important. Or perhaps on yet another occasion I'm attempting a mountain that's more difficult or dangerous or exposed than any I've attempted before, so the fear factor might be magnified. And come to think of it, fear and the sublime are two 
two closely related and intertwined conditions. Or, I suppose I could feel particularly challenged by a certain mountain or a certain route. I may want that sense of accomplishment from succeeding at it, from reaching the top. Now, it's actually right here that there's a tangent I wanted to go off on and explore for a minute. Most of those I've talked to who regularly, regularly climb the high mountains seem to have the completion of some list as their overarching goal. Around here, the most popular goal is to climb all the 14ers in Colorado, with some people pursuing variations of this, like climbing all the 14ers with a minimum of 3,000 feet of elevation gained on each individual peak, or climbing all the 14ers within some constrained time frame. And there are plenty of other lists and goals and goal variations. Now, I wouldn't say to not pursue cumulative goals or lists at all. I mean, I engage in it myself in a casual way, so I wouldn't say not to go for these at all, but I would suggest that the over-prioritization and headlong pursuit of such goals could act to obscure the main source of illumination that, if anything, could be said to be unique to climbing the mountains. If, the main, if indeed the main fulfillment in doing so is to be found in the aesthetic and the sublime, then that necessitates that it's only there to be had through lived experience and through the conditions of lived experience, through the spatial and the temporal, through being there. As such, it's really more akin to a process, not a finality like crossing the finish line and certainly not like a finished and fixed object, like a perfect geometric shape or something. My lived life is not a 58-sided polygon. 58, of course, being the currently accepted value for the total number of 14ers in the state, depending on who you ask. So yeah, my life isn't a 58-sided polygon. And when you think of it, and especially if each climb does contain the potential for self-encounter self as part of its essence, then to measure myself against such abstractions would seem a rather awkward and unseemly juxtaposition. And besides, who knows, several years from now, after the next round of elevation measurements, the geologic surveys could effectively tell you that now your life needs to be a 59 or a 60 sided polygon and not just 58 anymore. Now, I imagine there are those who insist that they have no problem earnestly and diligently pursuing these cumulative goals while also taking in the experience to the fullest. I'm actually inclined to think that could be easier said than done. If you're putting an inordinate amount of your mental energies and focus and time and enthusiasm into cumulative goal pursuits and into all the logistics and everything else associated with it, then can you really just shut all that off when your feet hit the trail? I think you would inevitably take some of that with you. After all, there isn't some switch in the mind that, when flipped, will transition me immediately and at will from one set of concerns to another, from one thought paradigm to another. To be sure, though, as I mentioned, even I engage in some casual cumulative goal pursuits. Each year I try to make it up some of the 14ers or other mountains I haven't been to yet, but also each year I find myself returning to some of the ones I've already been to once, twice, or even three times or more. Now, if someday that happens to translate into checking all the boxes on more lists, then great, so be it. But if not, so what? So, to return now from that tangent and back finally to the main question, my reasons for climbing a mountain may indeed vary with the occasion, but can I still speak generally to the question? Yeah, I think that's what I've been trying to do, I suppose. To try and sum it all up, I would say that for me, following the requisite process of origination and habituation and acquiring affinity and an affinity for it, mountain climbing brings together a host of already individually strong drives within me and ties them together in the longing to experience the sense of the sublime and with it the sense of discovering and rejuvenating the self through the awe and the wonder of the world in which and to which the self is immediately, intimately, and inextricably bound. 
So yeah, I think I think I've said enough and I'm going to leave it at that. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.